grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Fairmount Presbyterian Church. My name is Ryan Wallace. I'm one of the pastors here at Fairmount, and it is um, an honor to be with you here today to celebrate the life of one of God's faithful servants, John Keeger. Um, I'm joined today in worship by my colleague, Reverend Lindsay Heron Lewis, uh, Jim Riggs, our director of music, um, and Tyler Young, um, our technology coordinator. Um, we, uh, you may have noticed the lights flicker in here just a little bit. We uh, may be losing uh, power and internet intermittently with the weather, I assume. Our live stream is back up for those of you who are uh, joining us online. Um, welcome, but be assured that if the live stream goes out at any point, we are recording the service also, and we will get that up on YouTube as soon as uh, we can. Uh, we gather today united by a common sorrow. We all experienced a few weeks ago the shock and the grief of losing um, somebody we loved so suddenly, and filled with grief and sadness and loss and confusion. But we also gather today united by a common hope that we worship a God who promises that death is not the end, a God whose love is more powerful than even death. We've come together today also to give thanks for John's life, to remember the ways that his life touched ours and to entrust him once and for all to God's care. We've also come to worship that God who loves us and whom we serve and whom John served in his life. And so today we remember the words of the Apostle Paul who wrote, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things past, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. As we prepare our hearts to worship God and to celebrate John's life together, we offer a special recognition to his mother, Anne Keeger, a longtime Fairmount member who sadly isn't able to travel to be here with us today, but who's watching on live stream. Um, and we send our prayers and our love to you today, Anne, and know that you are with us in spirit here. Please join me in a word of opening prayer. Eternal God, we acknowledge the uncertainty of our life on earth. As we come before you in prayer, you know our needs even before we ask. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, even in death, you are with us, God. Show us now your grace that as we face the mystery of death, we may also see the light of eternity. Help us to believe what we cannot see with our own eyes, trusting that you will always be there to lead us, God. And bring us at last with all your saints into the joy of your home through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 14. You'll find that in the purple book in front of you. We'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 4.
You may be seated. As we enter into a time of remembrance, we have several speakers this afternoon, and the first is Carissa, John's daughter. Hello, thank you all for being here today. Um, I'll just share something short. Um, one, one thing I love about my dad is that he was never afraid to verbalize impactful moments with those he loved. It would get to the point where I'd be standing next to him as he's talking to someone else and he would bring something up that would lead to a mini story about us and I knew exactly what he was going to refer to before he completed his sentence. I would proceed to internally roll my eyes. Although this happened frequently, he had a unique way of making me crack a smile, throwing jokes left and right for as long as I can remember. I've been scared that I'll forget memories I have with him, special moments in the day-to-day -day as I grow older and, and absorb new experiences. Thinking about this, though, I realize I'll always have that gentle reminder of my dad in me, since he preferred being an oversharer to an undersharer. <laughs> My mind works similarly in some ways just through exposure. He's instilled in me some important life lessons. It's impossible to give too many hugs and I love yous. You can always find it cheaper somewhere. <laughs> Gratitude and sharing that is key. Always treat things, but more importantly, people with respect. I want to share wise words, but I don't know how. All I can really say is that he was so endlessly full of love, and I think that's something we need more of. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> when I was 17, I got this idea in my head to escape my monotonous life, my monotonous Swiss life, by running away to Cleveland for a semester. But I couldn't attend Shaker Heights High School unless I had a guardian living in Shaker Heights. So John became my legal guardian. <laughs> we hired a lawyer, and he adopted me at 17. This is one of my college friend's favorite anecdotes about my life because it seems so crazy. And I agree. But that's the kind of family I have. That's the kind of person John was. He never even hesitated. He knew this was something I really wanted, something that would make me happy, so he did it. So John became my guardian, and that's what I referred to him as. And he called me his second daughter, and even years later, when Carissa and I were in a room together, he'd say, there are my two daughters, in his warm, boisterous voice, eyes twinkling. And he was joking, but he also wasn't. And it meant the world to me that he wasn't just doing my dad, his cousin, a favor by letting me stay with them, but that I became a part of the family. Even long after I moved out, John would tell the banana story. This is one of these stories that Carissa mentions. <laughs> when I lived with the Keegers, I always made myself smoothies, and my recipe said half a banana. So every morning, I would cut a banana in half and put the other half in the fridge. John noticed this and bought me small bananas so I wouldn't have to leave <laughs> half-eaten bananas in the fridge. But my recipe still said half a banana, so I still cut the bananas in half. <laughs> I feel kind of silly writing this in my eulogy of him, but it's, it's so trivial, but it matters to me. It shows he paid attention to detail. He cared. He did little things to make me feel welcome. And he wasn't really even annoyed that I didn't do the rational thing, but he was certainly going to make fun of me for it. To show affection, closeness, nostalgia, to show other people he really knows me, really knew me. It wasn't always easy, there were hard times, but I never felt unwelcome or unloved. That was out of the question, John made sure of it. And to me, like to John, Family sometimes means cho choosing closeness over comfort, support over personal space. Like when I called him, mouth still half full with dinner, because I had remembered the date wrong of my flight to DC, and it was actually in two hours, and he and his girlfriend at the time dropped their plans to race back and pick me up and get me there on time. 
He wasn't even mildly annoyed. He just said something like, we're going to get you there, or at least we're going to try. Or how he spent hours organizing and attending parent-teacher conferences to get me accommodations. Or how he came to every choir concert. Or how he spent three days straight decluttering the living room so Carissa could have the perfect sweet 16. You won't get to see Carissa graduate, see his kids become who they're meant to be. He won't get to be a grandfather to his, ki to his kids' kids, to all of our kids. He would have been such a great grandfather. It doesn't feel fair. But John is still so present in my mind. His laugh, his raunchy humor, the energy he brought into every room he entered. Like the time some guys were catcalling me from ne the next car, and he made kissy faces at them, and we couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> it got quite the reaction out of them. Um, I think of the road trip um, we took to Hamilton College on my 18th birthday, driving through the quiet night, reflecting on emotions and masculinity. I think of all the times John barged into Carissa's room when we were talking on the phone and started telling me about his newest spiritual journey or his relationships up relationship updates, and it was quite the digression from the conversation, but I didn't mind. The last conversation I had with John was in January, when I wished him a happy birthday, and he sent me info about who to call to get out of jury duty. <laughs> it was quick and simple, but he was always looking out for me, taking care of me until the end. I'll always treasure that. When I think of John, I think of the true meaning of family and what I can learn from him about it. I want to show warmth, affection, closeness through my words, through my actions, like John did so effortlessly. And when my cousin's kids want to escape their real life for a little while, I hope they'll think of their Aunt Aviva like I thought of my Uncle John. And I hope they, they know I'll say yes, just like him. Thank you. Thank you, Aviva. And now I'd like to call up Ben Rosenbaum, Aviva's dad, and a cousin of John's from his mother's side. Thanks. Oh, I hope I have my glasses. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. I've spent the last couple of weeks cleaning out John's house. It was full to bursting with evidence of his love and enthusiasm. Photos he took, letters he saved, kids' artwork all over the walls materials for projects he was eagerly preparing to tackle someday. His brother's and his father's and his mother's stuff, which he took charge of the way he took charge of everything, including, as you just heard, my daughter when she needed him, because, because John was a mensch. His older brother's teenage rebellion took the classic form of heavy metal and motorcycles, tough guy stuff. But John was never very interested in being tough. He was interested in creation and connection. He was already falling in love with photography, so his teenage rebellion involved catching his mother yawning or blinking on film, <laughs> photos that he found hilarious. Oh, John, she would yell, exasperated. John didn't mind provoking, getting under your skin. But his provocations, just like his acts of service and love and caring and his enthusiasms, were always about getting closer. Enthusiasm, of course, is from the Greek, en theos, the god inside. At our Grandma Jean's memorial service, John told us about the night before she died, how he and Will had been talking about life and death, and that in the natural order of things, Grandma Jean would probably be next to go. I now believe, John said then, that this was the Holy Spirit talking to me, telling, letting Will and me know. The idea of the Shekhinah gently descending on John while he was doing what he was most enthusiastic about, being a loving father, is not far-fetched at all. John was full to bur bursting with spirit. This is why, though he might provoke, he was incapable of trolling. He could never dehumanize anyone. He could always see the God inside us looking out. 
He, of course, should not have been the next to go, but he was. And the world is colder without him. And his irrepressible laugh, and his persistent, eager, loving, provocative, outrageous, tenacious, stubborn, relentless, delighted, gracious, redemptive enthusiasm. I'd like to invite Kate Keeger to come forward. Kate is a cousin from, of John's from his father's side. I'm going to read a poem, try to not cry. Uh, I'm dedicating this poem to Auntie Anne. Hi, Auntie Anne. Big kiss and hug for you. This poem was written by Edgar Albert Guest. He lost two children. And it goes like this. It's called A Child of Mine. I'm sorry. I will lend you for a little time a child of mine, he said. For you to love the while he lives and mourn for when he's dead, it may be six or seven years, or 22 or three, but will you, till I call him back, take care of him for me? He'll bring his charms to gladden you, and should his stay be brief, you'll have his lovely memories as solace for your grief. I cannot promise he will stay since all from earth return, but there are lessons taught down there I want this child to learn. I've looked the world over in search of, for teachers true, and from throngs that crowd life's lanes, I have selected you. Now will you give him all your love, nor think the labor vain? nor hate me when I come to take him home again. I fancied that I heard them say, Dear Lord, thy will be done, for all the joys thy child shall bring, the risk of grief will run. We'll shelter him with tenderness, we'll love him while we may, and for the happiness we've known forever grateful to stay. But should the angels call for him much sooner than we've planned, will brave the bitter grief that comes and try to understand. Thank you, Kate. Um, Tyler, can you do a wide shot? This is a weird moment, but I'm gonna ask you all to turn around and look at the middle door just above it. That's the camera. And I miss Anne so much too. So if you all would just wave. There we go. We can know that Anna's with us here in spirit also. Uh, next up is Ron Douglas. If you would want to come forward and share your remarks. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Ron Douglas, and I was a friend of John's. And I want to thank everyone for being here today and paying tribute to our dear friend and, and our beloved John. John and I met uh, years ago, right, on a day trip to Chicago. That was the day he officially joined the Buddhist organization we were both a part of, in which he was active in, the Soka Gakkai International, that is, in, in addition to this church, right? So everyone from the Cleveland area that day who joined us were packed in two large uh, Ford vans to make the long trip to Chicago, starting at three in the morning. The trip started in a dark and chilly fall day in a parking lot in Cleveland Heights, and we were all nestled, all men, mind you, right, in the back of these two vans with three black bench seats. I had the good fortune of sitting in the back of one of the vans, um, sitting next to John, right, purely by chance. Everyone was dressed casually, but as I would learn later, John was decked in a nice uh, coat and a bow tie, right? There were about eight to 10 men in each van, and each person wisely decided to fall asleep. But John and I talked the entire time. Let me rephrase that, John talked to me the entire time. <laughs> At the time, our, our lives were both in transition. I had just moved to Cleveland from Boston, 
and ended a long relationship. I was heartbroken. I was devastated. Um, John was just ending a long-term relationship at that time, too. He was heartbroken. He was devastated. And we bonded instantly. From that point forward, we became fast friends. We would hike for hours every Thursday, generally in the North Chagrin Metro Park, and John would speak endless praise for Carissa and Will. He loved you too very much and was so proud of you. Talk current events and politics, stock picks, share uh, life stories about photography, growing up, family, friends. Cur curiously, he would send me endless apps he thought I should download <laughs> almost daily, right? He would speak at, 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 at length about his girlfriend, Carrie, too, who he loved very much. So just weeks before John's death, we had a brief but very intense argument during one of our long hikes. However, we re reconciled days later, literally affirming that we were friends for life. Little did we know, however, however two weeks later, John would be gone. Nitra and Daishonin, whose life uh, upon which we base the Buddhism we practice, once said, he, when he was alive, he was a Buddha in life. Now that he is a Buddha in death, he was a Buddha in both life and death. This is what is meant by the most important doctrine called attaining Buddhahood in one, pre in, presence, in one present form. John was a Buddha in life, and now he is a Buddha in death. So what is a Buddha? Buddha just means an ordinary person, right? However, it's a little bit more than that. It also means one enlightened to the internal uh, and ultimate truth of reality of all things, one which leads others to the same enlightenment. And that's really John, right? I'm sure John chose this life to teach us not to take each other for granted, not to take life for granted, to love deeply, to enjoy life, to protect the people we love, and to believe in everyone's capacity to live with wisdom, compassion, and strength, especially in the most trying of times. That's what John, I believe John is teaching us now, and I know that's what he's teaching me. The great uh, 20th, 21st century philosopher and peace advocate Daisaku Okada once said, People's memories and recollections about a person who has passed away, the example of that person's life, can be a great source of encouragement and strength. That's how I choose to, to remember John, a wonderful friend in life who was a great source of encouragement and strength, a great friend, a teacher, and a guide on how to li love others and the best live life. And for that, I want to thank you, my friend, until such time we meet again. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And lastly, I'd like to call up Don Shulcoat, a friend of John's. Good morning, everyone. I first give honor to God, who is the head of my life. I'm Don Shulcoat. I'm a musician, music educator, composer, a photographer, and a deep friend of John. I grew up with uh, John at Fremont Presbyterian Church, possibly playing Clevenites ice hockey. Lost touch with him for some years. I reconnected on the beautiful opportunity to teach his daughter Carissa piano lessons in the early 2010s. I was only a year back in Cleveland, and he made other solid opportunities and connections for me as a music teacher, most notably the Nana, For Nana More family, for which I am grateful. He was a wonderful connector of people. He was witty, fun, and beautifully quirky. This passing is way too soon for me. John was an amazing person. I will remember, forever remember his smile and his turn, frown, upside down joy. The way he looked out for everyone's move. He loved his kids, he loved his family. It showed in the little things he did and it mattered. He paused his life to give those in need, in his kids and in his church. John had wit, humor from the farthest, very farthest of left field funny and wacky, sometimes not even in the ballpark. Just where did he get this? I always asked. I always learned something from John. He had a habit of having many, many threads of conversations going all at once. He was brilliant and confusing, even to the best of us. He was obviously out thinking us all. He was one step ahead winning every chess game, simply brilliant. One day in the last two summers, maybe late 2022, John invited me to kayak with him. As always, it was incredibly interesting to me the unique things he's done and seen, an endless inspiration and fascination, a curiosity and zest for life. I had just gotten a boat permit for my canoe, and he, we ended up canoeing the mouth of the Cuyahoga into Lake Erie. 
to a dock near the Rock Hall in three to, foot, three to five foot troughs and 20 to 40 foot of water. Oh my gosh. Ironically, it, ha it rained heavily down, heavily on the way down in the car, and most normal people would have turned around for sure. But that didn't sway us. We thought nothing of it. It's Ohio. Wait 10 minutes, and the weather will be different. It was that day, and we went with his courage. We stopped for a moment at an eatery and, and possibly another late storm, but it never showed up. He was simult simultaneously cautious and fearless. I probably would have never, ever chosen that trip, but his zest was an incredible driver for living in the moment. I saw him as recently as two weeks at Walmart late night. I was exhausted, but he had boundless energy. I will remember his smile, his warmth, his Fairmont Church involvement, his insane tech, technology adoption, and always informing everything about things you need, things you may not or can't quite figure out how to use and don't know how to use yet, but anyway. His thoughtfulness in his actions, his word, his duty to kindness. He was one of the truly beautiful ones. I ask God why he's gone too soon, and I myself have no answer. I'm devastated. I leave it all in his hands. I have gratitude for the gift of his being. God's grace, cover, God's grace and mercy covers. I pray for healing for all those who knew and loved him, for all of us, and for the peace that passes all understanding. Thank you all for those beautiful words about John. I invite you to join me now as we turn to scripture um, to read together Psalm 23. The text is printed in your bulletin, um, and if you're comfortable, we'll read it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Will you please rise and join in singing hymn number 834, from the hymnal, Precious Lord, Take My Hand.
I'm Gordon Lanfeld, and this is a public service message from John Keeger. Um, many of you had the advantage of these glasses this last week, and there is absolutely no reason to recycle them because you can use them daily. <laughs> also, there is this wonderful app that I want you all to know about in today's Apps Gone Free. Uh, this one is, has uh, regularly, it's $89.99 per year, but it's free today. This is movies, watch movies, embrace the endless possibilities of entertainment with movies. I highly recommend you download the app today. You will love it. Our first reading comes from Psalm 46, verses one through five. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. Our second reading comes from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, friends, this is the last place that I want to be today. It's a weird thing for a pastor to say, I know, but as many have said before me today, and I'm sure many of you in the pews and those of you watching at home have said to one another, it feels too soon to be gathered here in this way for John. And so I'm going to go ahead and name that I don't want to be here today. We just heard these words, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble the psalmist was no stranger to trouble, to worry and fear, to pain and death. We find in the book of Psalms words to describe and articulate every emotion that God has given us to feel. Love, pain, anger, frustration, confusion, comfort, even joy. The psalmist who wrote these words understood that belief in God did not mean that trouble would not find him but rather that God would never leave him, no matter what happened to him or around him. Today is a day full of all of the emotions God has given us to feel. Love, pain, anger, frustration, confusion, comfort, even joy. Human relationships are complicated, and so is our grief. While we may give thanks to God for the gift of knowing and being known by John, we may also be shaking our fist at God and asking why such a caring man might have so few years in which to live out his vocation as father and friend, photographer, historian, and connector of people. I wish that I had an answer. I wish I had all the right words to speak in this moment, but what I have instead is my strong belief, along with the psalmist, that while we may not know or understand what is going, around us, going on around us, 
while we may not have control over all that affects us and those that we love, God with us, even when we feel most alone or alienated from others, God comforts us. Even when we can't find the words to express what is going on in our bodies and minds, God knows and hears us. Even when we're angry and yelling at God, God loves us. We gather today to celebrate John's life and we also grieve his death, but we are given hope that any pain that he experienced in his life and the pain that we now experience in his death will one day be no more. For the God who created us, who created this world, will one day make all things new. This God who created us also raised Jesus from the dead to life everlasting and gives us hope that we too might find new life. Well, last week as I was sitting in my backyard with my cool to attach the film from the glasses to my phone so that I could take a picture of the moon's shadow moving across the sun. I needed John's expertise in that moment, his plan and potential jerry-rigging of a way to capture that moment on film so that I'd never forget it, could maybe even hang it on my wall. But sitting by myself, I couldn't figure it out. And so I was left with only really terrible pictures of what may be a crescent sun and vaguely a sun, and the world grew dark around me. I was able to take off the glasses and really see. And what I was struck by was not how dark it was, but how there is still that glimmer of twilight light. Being a preacher type, the words from the Gospel of John echoed in my mind, a light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. On a day in which we are gathered for a service we would rather not ever have to attend, this image and message ring true. There is darkness, yes. There is trouble and there are valleys of death, yes. And at the same time, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Even in the darkness of this moment, a light shines, and it is a light that cannot be overcome. May you know the light of God's love. May you know the support of community. May you believe or come to believe that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And may all of these things, coupled with the gift of being connected to John, bring you hope for this life and the next. Alleluia and amen. Let us come now together into a time of prayer. O God, before whom generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. We especially thank you for your servant John, whose baptism is now complete in death. We praise you for the gift of his life, for all in him that was good and kind and faithful, for the grace you gave him that kindled in him the love of Christ and enabled him to serve you faithfully. We thank you that for John, death has passed and pain ended, and that he has now entered the joy that you have prepared. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. We pray this through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, using the words most comfortable to us in our traditions, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you please rise and body your spirit and join in singing Amazing Grace, number 649, the first three verses.
You may be seated. You all sound beautiful. <laughs> and sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God our brother John, and we commit his body to be returned to its elements, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Merciful God, you heal the broken in heart and bind up the wounds of the afflicted. Strengthen us in our weakness, calm our troubled spirits, and dispel our doubts and fears. In Christ rising from the dead, you conquer death and open the gates to everlasting life. Renew our trust in you, that by the power of your love, we shall one day be brought together again with John. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. After the service is ended, I will guide the family out, and then you all are welcome to join us in Anderson Hall for a light reception and to greet John's family. I am sure there are many more stories to tell than what we heard today. When I got here today, um, I was cleaning up, there was a little bit of a mess over here, and I found an old bulletin from a church service a week or two ago, and on it were written in a child's handwriting the lyrics to, I want it that way. <laughs> so I took a picture of it and I texted my son, and I said, was this you? No, mom. And it just made me imagine what all John might have gotten up to in this building. <laughs> and what time for young disciples or children's time might have been like as John came forward. And it makes me sad that we don't continue to have that spirit with us. But I am grateful for all of you and the ways in which I think that spirit has become a part of you and the ways in which you can carry that out into the world. And so friends, as you go into the world, go knowing that you are surrounded and faithful children today and always. Amen.